Welcome to Bible Theory Podcast, hosted by the Chicano Knox. Finally, a podcast about the church for the church. Bible Theory is for the streets, homie. This ain't your boy scout, choir boy type of podcast. This is for the Vato Locos who have been saved by the blood of Christ, homie. Coming straight out of Geneva. Donde están mis soldados reformados? Bienvenido a la Teoria de la Biblia podcast con el Chicano Knox. You are now entering into the reform state of mind, homie. Where we study ecclesiology and take it to the streets, homie. Coming from that five solas. Coming from that reformed underground railroad, homie. Coming from that West West 1646, yes sir. All right, thank you so much for joining Bible Theory once again. Uh, thank you for all your support. Thank you for uh, listening to me and checking out, uh, you know, the survey of ecclesiology. That's right, the doctrine of the church which is my podcast is all about. It's about ecclesiology, the called out ones. Um, because as we look at society right now, you know, it's, it seems like it's falling apart more and more. <laughs> and, you know, what can hold us together, what unites us together is Jesus, is the gospel and his body of Christ. So I encourage you, listener, uh, to fall in love with the, body of Christ, with the body of Christ, to fall in love not only with the gospel, which is our cement that holds different people together, like what holds all kinds of strangers together, right? From different backgrounds, uh, from all over the world, from different continents, different everything is the gospel. So when you look at, when you look at the body of Christ, it's a beautiful mosaic of gospel uh, changed lives uh, of people coming together uh, corporately and worshiping the Lord. And in this episode, I definitely want to be talking about the church. Uh, we're going to be talking about Charles Spurgeon. Uh, Phil, thank you so much for joining Bible Theory, uh, you know, reaching, uh, reaching the hood for Christ. Uh, Thanks, reaching, Jesse. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on Charles Spurgeon. Um, you know, for those in the hood, you know, those in inner city Memphis, East, East Los, uh, you know, everywhere in the ghettos, in the hood, they say, you know, impoverished areas, the plantations, I guess, some conservatives say, people who don't know you, why don't you give them a little introduction of who you are, what you do, maybe how you came to Christ, and All right. just a little bit about yourself. Well, I came to Christ uh, at age 17. Uh, I'd grown up in a United Methodist background, so I went to church all my life, but it was a very liberal church where uh, the Bible wasn't taught as authoritative. I never heard the gospel. and. Uh, I opened my Bible at random one night when I was troubled about something. And I thought, I I just want to read a Bible verse. And it, to me, it was like a horoscope in the newspaper that maybe the Bible would say, I, my eyes would light on some verse that would say something good to me. And I flipped it open at random. And the Bible opened to the first page of 1 Corinthians, which is not where you'd send a 17 year old for an evangelistic message. But I thought, I've never read a whole book of the Bible. I'll see. I'll start reading this and see how far it goes. And just the first three chapters of First Corinthians absolutely devastated my entire worldview. I thought that if I was good and intelligent and did everything with excellence and tried to be wise, and I was really into secular politics as well, I thought if my politics are right, then God will love me. And uh, th those first three chapters of First Corinthians is where Paul just dismantles the idea that human wisdom is a good thing. He says, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. And uh, it's so much in there about how the Lord despises uh, the, the impressive things of this world. And he chooses those who are poor and disenfranchised and all that, as opposed to, you know, the people who are powerful and, and religious and, and all of that. And it just left me thinking, well, if God hates the best things about me, then I'm really in trouble. 
And uh, so I kept reading First Corinthians and got through at least chapter 12, where, uh, and I didn't understand much of it, but there were things along the way that made sense that continued to convict me and, and point me to Christ. And in chapter 12, that's where Paul says that no one speaking by the Holy Spirit can uh, curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And again, I didn't understand the context of that or what it meant, but I understood enough to know what Scripture is saying is that Jesus is Lord, and I need to bow to him and let him basically take the wheel of my life. I'd always sort of lived by that bumper sticker of philosophy that God is my co-pilot. Mm. And uh, that text made me realize, you know what, I need to switch seats with him. <laughs> and uh, and so I did. And an amazing thing over the next few days, things happened to me that had never happened. A guy gave me a gospel track in the shopping mall, mm. and it had a pretty good uh, explanation of the gospel in it. And then a friend who I barely knew called me up and just at random invited me to an evangelistic crusade. He uh, he he went to a church where they they were kind of legalistic and they told everybody in the church you you must invite at least one person to this. And so he I think had looked through the list of his friends and figured I was a friend he could afford to lose. And so he invited me and he was very surprised when I said yeah I'd like to go. Uh, and so I went to this evangelistic crusade later in that same week where. The preacher was talking about the atonement, the crucifixion of Christ, and he started in Isaiah 53, which I wasn't very literate about Scripture, but I knew enough to know that Isaiah is the Old Testament. And I thought, how can that be about the crucifixion of Christ? But I listened to it and read it for myself, and and, uh, just the realization that Isaiah, hundreds of years before Christ, described the crucifixion in such detail. Uh, that convinced me, look, the Bible is true and it's authoritative, and I've never had a doubt about it since. And uh, so the Lord, you know, began to direct my steps. I went to Moody Bible Institute and got a degree there uh, and began working in publishing at Moody Press, editing books, theological books. And that work uh, sort of drew me together with John MacArthur. And uh, he liked my work. I liked his content. And one day he said to me, you should quit your job with the publisher and just come to work for me. And I said, OK, that was 39 years ago uh, right now. And uh, I'm about about a week away from celebrating my 39th anniversary working for Grace to You, John MacArthur's media ministry. Amen. Uh, I'm the executive director there. And also the voice you hear on the radio Alongside John MacArthur, I introduce him. So a lot of people will know me from there. I've uh, been here nearly 40 years, and uh, I've loved every minute of it. Amen. So that's my background. I am, I'm the executive director of Grace to You. If you listen to John MacArthur, uh, then you probably encountered my name somewhere. Absolutely. Um, I think, I'm not sure if I met you or one of the elders at uh, Grace Community um, of so while back. Um, but. Uh, I'll never forget that. I'm not sure if it was you or someone else. But I do got a side note. I was in L.A. recently for the Super Bowl outreach, uh, passing out gospel tracks, open air preaching and stuff like that. Yeah. And I, met, I met a couple, a couple, a real couple. Um, they were called the Racers. The racers. Uh, it was Dor- uh, Dory and Rich. And yeah. they've been going to Grace Community for, uh, for several years, many years. Um, so they told me to give you a shout out. And <laughs> all right. Yes, I know them. Yeah. So I was working with them. I had the privilege to get to know them. What a lovely couple. And I want to commend you for your uh, shepherding. And I want to commend uh, MacArthur for his shepherding uh, over the racers. What a beautiful example of what God is doing at Grace Community. Um, and it, I, I, I got to see it with this wonderful couple um, who I got to spend almost a week with. And it was great. That is um, good. Yeah. Amen. And. So, um, so that, yeah, that's wonderful. You know, working with MacArthur, MacArthur was my, uh, one of my gateways, my major gateways. Uh, I know for a lot of, um, Calvinist people that I know a lot of the gateways, uh, I call it the gateway drug to the reform world. For me, it was MacArthur. Other people was like Driscoll or somebody else. Yeah. But MacArthur was like, you know, for me, it was like MacArthur study Bible a long time ago. 
But um, I, I remember him quoting Spurgeon. Um, at least for me, the first time I heard him quote Spurgeon was like in 2008. And I was like, you know what? Who is this Spurgeon guy? He quotes him like three or four times in the sermon. So I write him down. I said, okay, Charles Spurgeon. And I don't even think I spelled it right. And then I go back and I Google him and I'm, I'm like, I'm like listening to him on YouTube and I'm like, okay, well, you know, someone reading. And then I, I, I get a book. My friend gives me a book called Morning and Evening's Devotion. So I read that within almost a little over a year and I was like blown away. I was like, this guy has an amazing, amazing um, discipleship. You could just tell through the reading that this man has some close fellowship with the Lord. So for those who don't know, um, you know, who are, you know, I'm trying to introduce the Reformed faith to people who are hungry and thirsty for some Bible, Um, you know, hashtag eat your Bible. (laughs) So can you give us a synopsis of, uh, for those who don't know, who Charles Spurgeon is, who he was, and why should we even care about this guy? Spurgeon pastored in London in the 1800s. He started in 1855. Uh, pastoring the largest Baptist church in London and uh, was there until his death in 1892. Uh, And he would preach to wherever he preached, he would fill the auditorium. He never, there were never empty seats. Usually people turned away. He was the most popular preacher of his era, the most famous and influential. All his sermons were uh, transcribed by hand and published verbatim within a week after he preached them and distributed literally worldwide. So all of his sermons were recorded, you know, on in print. Sadly, nobody ever recorded his voice. Uh, But all of his sermons, we have a pretty thorough record of about 3,500 sermons that he preached in his lifetime. And it's some of the best preaching you will ever find. He is, in my view, uh, after the apostle, from the time of the apostle Paul until now, there are two preachers that stand out as just absolutely phenomenal uh, preachers who we will never see the likes of them again. One was George Whitfield, who was the greatest evangelistic preacher that that church history has ever seen, and the other was Charles Spurgeon, who was the greatest uh, you know pastor as a preacher who preached every Sunday uh, that that we have in church history. And uh, it's interesting because Whitfield was sort of the model for Spurgeon in his preaching. Spurgeon started preaching in uh, London when he was barely out of his, in fact, I think he may have still been a teenager, 19 or 20 years old, uh, and and stayed in the same church for the rest of his life. Uh, he at one point preached to a crowd of more than 20,000 people without amplification. So he must have had a very powerful voice. But what's remarkable about him is the theological content of his sermons. Uh, And you can read his material from his youngest years until the day he died. And I don't know of any major shift in his theology. He just preached the same doctrine and the same gospel from the beginning to the end. But it was never it was never repetitive. It was never boring or or uh, you don't find him even doing what I do. Sometimes if I have a good sermon, I'll, I'll preach it several times. Uh, I, I don't know of any occasion where he ever preached the same sermon a second time. So he was prolific and he was an amazing reader. He had uh, his, his own mother had some health problems that forced him out of the home to, to be cared for by his grandparents for the first four years of his life or five years. Uh, and, uh, his grandfather was a pastor. His father was a lay pastor. So he came from a family of pastors. And as a young boy, he started reading Puritan literature before he was even 10 years old. He loved his grandfather's library, these old books everywhere with leather bindings. And he said uh, that was what first caught his eye. He just loved the look and feel and smell of the books. But as soon as he could read, he began to devour the content. And so he was reading stuff like John Owen before he was 12 years old. Uh, wow. John Owen is is thick reading. Even I'm 69 years old and 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 I struggle to stay with John Owen. But Spurgeon had an incredible mind and an ability to learn and retain things. He had a near photographic memory. So he remembered whatever he read. 
And all of this content came out in his sermons. He spoke in biblical language. Uh, he would just casually uh, work obscure quotations from scripture into his sermons. You have to be very attentive to know when he says something, what's he referring to? Uh, if it sounds like King James language, it's usually a quote from scripture. And if you just do a search, you'll find the text he's referring to. He made a comment once that he wanted to be so full of scripture that if you cut him, he would bleed biblene. Uh, and it was pretty much like that. If he talked, it came out scripture, you know, and when he preached, it came out scripture. Uh, and uh, so there's nobody like him ever. And his influence was very long lasting. But towards the end of his life, he entered into some controversies that began to diminish his influence because the drift of evangelical Christianity in that day was moving towards modernism, liberalism. And he, he stood in the middle of that road and said, don't, don't go down this road. And lots of people mocked him and refused to listen to him and said he was raising alarm about nothing important. And that if the church didn't keep up with the times, it was going to lose its influence. And Spurgeon said, no, we have to stay with the gospel or we're going to lose our influence. And um, subsequent events, of course, vindicated him. He was absolutely right. The people who who pursued the modernist approach, they began to deny the miracles of Scripture and, and question the authority of Scripture. And whole denominations in the early part of the 20th century went liberal and lost their influence completely. Uh, and we don't even remember who most of those people are, but people still read Spurgeon sermons and benefit from them. And you can read them today. It's just as edifying as it was when he preached them. So he's he's my favorite preacher from church history. And uh, uh, I've, I've just developed a great love for him. And uh, when I first got on the Internet in 1995, I began to collect his sermons and put them online. Uh, on a website that I called the Spurgeon Archive. I couldn't keep up with it, so ultimately I gave it to uh, Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas City because they they actually own Spurgeon's physical library, the books that he had in his house when he died. Uh, they purchased those and have them on display there in Kansas City. So now they have the website as well, and uh, trying to get all of those 3,500 sermons ultimately posted on the internet. Um, most of them are there now. So, um, but I, I started that project back in 1995 and um, uh, that was at the beginning really of my, my love for Spurgeon and my studying his life. Uh, so I've been doing that for, what is that now? Nearly, nearly 20, nearly 30 years. He has almost 30 years, almost yeah. as some of my audience is alive, as, as long as they have been, been alive. Yeah. Because most of my demographic of listeners is between uh, 24 to 34 years old. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, Charles Spurgeon sounds like he's he would have been an awesome guy to, like, get into a time machine and just go back into that time period just to go hear him preach on a Sunday at a. Metropolitan, right? Um, Tabernacle. Yeah, um, Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. A, a few years after I started the website, I got a phone call from the pastor of the Metro the current pastor of uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, who uh, uh, kindly Peter Masters, right? To Peter Masters. Yeah, Peter Masters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and he uh, he had read an article I wrote about hyper Calvinism uh, that he liked, and he wanted to publish it in in the church's magazine. So I gave him permission to do that. And he invited me to come there and speak at a conference. Uh, and so over, over the next few years, I, it was my privilege to speak there from Spurgeon's pulpit five or six times. And uh, uh, that's, that's one of the highlights of my life. Yeah. So, that's like uh, getting into a NASCAR or something <laughs> yeah. for a pastor, you know? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned something real quick. Um, you said hyper Calvinism. There's a lot of uh, myths about Calvinism, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, rumors, a lot of false knowledge and fake news out there about uh, Calvinism. First of all, let's go ahead and deal with this uh, issue where people would like to label uh, incorrectly, I think, uh, of Charles Spurgeon as a hyper Calvinist and they disregard him and they quickly sweep him on. They would like to sweep him under the rug of history and say he's nothing but a hyper Calvinist person 
um, who caused nothing but trouble. So if you would like, just to give us a brief introduction of what hyper-Calvinism is, first of all, and what are the dangers of that, and how that problem or that myth came to attach itself to Spurgeon, and how he overcame that. Sure. I'll be real candid and say at the outset, anyone who says uh, that Spurgeon is a hyper-Calvinism is just displaying a grotesque kind of ignorance. Spurgeon was not a hyper-Calvinist. Hyper-Calvinism was a problem in England uh, during his lifetime, and he was despised by the hyper-Calvinists. They said he's not not strong enough in his Calvinism because he would preach the gospel indiscriminately and invite people to respond. And hyper-Calvinism is a view that says, you know, unless you're elect, uh, you you shouldn't— the gospel doesn't apply to you. I can't preach the gospel to people if I'm not certain they're elect. Well, the only way to know whether someone's among the elect or not is whether he believes, and he's not going to believe until he hears the gospel. And Spurgeon understood this, so he preached the gospel uh, and invited all comers, just like Jesus said, did, and um, uh, the hyper-Calvinists were upset by that. And uh, there's a great book on this subject by Ian Murray, and it's called Spurgeon and Hyper-Calvinism. And he chronicles in detail uh, the, the running war that Spurgeon had against hyper-Calvinism. He hated it. And uh, I, anybody who says Spurgeon was a hyper-Calvinist needs to read that book, Spurgeon and Hyper-Calvinism by Ian Murray. It's a little paperback book published by the Banner of Truth. And uh, one of the best resources I know on the subject of hyper-Calvinism. Uh, also, if you want a uh, uh, just a brief overview of hyper-Calvinism. The article I mentioned that I wrote that Peter Masters uh, republished back maybe 25 years ago is still online. It's on the web. It's called A Primer on Hyper-Calvinism. Uh, and you just do a Google search for my name and A Primer on Hyper-Calvinism, you'll find it. It's an article that'll take maybe 20 minutes to read and understand. It's it's as simple as possible. But it explains what hyper-Calvinism is and why it's not the same thing as Calvinism. Now, the reason people would say that about Spurgeon or you or me or or anyone is uh, there's a tendency, I think, among people who lean towards Arminianism, which is the the polar opposite view of Calvinism. There's a tendency among, among Arminians to label anything that has any hint of stress on the sovereignty of God and the doctrine of election, they'll label it hyper-Calvinism uh, and claim that we are, you know, undermining evangelism and all that. I mean, you told me you were here in Los Angeles just a couple of weeks ago for the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. ev- evangelizing people. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's it'd be pretty hard to to tag you as a a hyper-Calvinist because you're so devoted to evangelism. Well, the same thing was true of Spurgeon. Literally tens and tens of thousands of people came to Christ under Spurgeon's preaching and his influence. Uh, And in fact, because Spurgeon had gone through a time as a young, as a young adolescent where he was convicted and, and understood that he had not been converted to Christianity yet. He was convicted by his sin and he was looking for the way of salvation. And he went around from church to church and he'd hear these preachers and, and they would preach the law or they would preach some moral principle or what, but no one was preaching the gospel until he, he heard a guy who he, he, he described as almost illiterate preaching the gospel in such simple terms that uh, it was almost something you'd laugh at except for Spurgeon, it pierced his heart and he finally understood the gospel and came to Christ. And so he resolved early in his ministry that he would never preach any sermon without also including the gospel. So you can look at all of his sermons and what you'll find is there is an evangelistic message built into it. And that's one of the reasons the hyper-Calvinists of his time weren't happy with him. So anyone who says Spurgeon was a hyper-Calvinist simply doesn't know what he's talking about. And and also, I've found over the past 50 years or so, Spurgeon is so well-loved by everybody now that everybody wants to claim him, including a lot of Arminians who 
they don't agree with his Calvinism and they'll edit it out of his sermons, but they still want to claim Spurgeon because he was such an effective proclaimer of the gospel. Uh, and so he's a he's a good model for not only Calvinists, uh, but also a rebuke to both Arminians and hyper Calvinists alike. Yeah. Um, yeah. For those who don't know, uh, Calvinism, I would say, is a true representation of what the gospel is found in in, in the Bible. So, right. Those, you yeah. know, Spurgeon said it like this, and sometimes he'll be quoted out of context, and these words will be twisted, but he said, Calvinism is the gospel. Hmm. Now, what he meant by that was not that if you're not a Calvinist, you're not saved. He didn't believe that, and in fact, expressly said that he believes heaven will be full of people who were Arminians here on earth. They understand the gospel, but they're inconsistent in the way they treat the sovereignty of God and all of that. I agree with Spurgeon on that. I feel, I expect to see a lot of my Arminian friends in heaven. But I also agree with his statement that Calvinism is the gospel in this sense. And here's what he meant, that the heart of the gospel is the idea that salvation is God's work, not mine. I don't save myself. God saves me. And that is the message of Calvinism. I wouldn't be saved at all if God hadn't chosen me and drawn me to Christ and paid the price for my sin and and, and and awakened me so that I could believe. In other words, he did everything that was necessary for me to be saved, and I don't get credit for any of it, which is exactly what Paul is saying in that famous text in Ephesians 2, when he says, you're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. That's the message of Calvinism in a single verse. And that's what Spurgeon was saying. So the the heart of Calvinist theology is that salvation is the work of God, not the work of the sinner. And that is the gospel, isn't it? Right. It is an amazing gospel. And for me, I didn't find myself resisting to that idea. And what I love about ministering to supposed rejects, uh, supposed people who have, you know, tattoos on their faces versus people who don't have tattoos on their faces, is trust me. I preach to a lot of people, for example, in Venice Beach and Huntington Beach who have tattoos on their faces and a bunch of people who don't have tattoos on their faces. And the people who seem, the people who, to me, in my opinion, who were most receptive to the idea of total depravity, to the idea of sovereignty of God, uh, you know, the most two hurdles for people, I guess, would be the people who have tattoos on their faces. Because in my experience, they understand their depravity. Yeah. They, they, well, they in fact, that is that is precisely what Jesus meant when he said, those who are sick need a physician, not those who are well. Yeah. And he was, he was that was a barb aimed at the Pharisees who were fastidiously religious, but unbelieving. And so they were lost. And they were more lost than the publicans and prostitutes that, that Jesus ministered to because because of their religion, they thought they didn't have any need for a savior. Whereas the people who had plumbed the depths of sin understood that they couldn't save themselves. They couldn't earn forgiveness for the shameful things they had done, and they needed a savior. And so when Christ came promising salvation by grace through faith, saying it's the work of God, it's not something you can do for yourself, they responded. I mean, this was his message to Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes and and tells Jesus how great he is and everything. And he's a leading Pharisee. So he's one of the most religious people in the country. And Jesus says to him, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. Right. And Nicodemus understood, I believe, exactly what Jesus meant when he said, you know, can I crawl back in my mother's womb and be born again? He wasn't, he wasn't suggesting that he believed Jesus was literally saying that. He was making a comment about the impossibility of saving himself. He was saying, look, if I need to be born again, that is not something I can do for myself. And Jesus basically tells him, that's right. You know, the spirit blows where he wills. It's like the wind. You can't see where he came from or where he's going, but you know its effects. And uh, we know from the end of the Gospel of John that Nicodemus ultimately did become a believer. But in that encounter in John 3, he walks away from Jesus, I believe, without salvation because his religion was an impediment to his salvation because he couldn't fathom the idea that he needed something that he couldn't do for himself. 
Whereas in the very next chapter, you have the woman at the well who had a deplorable marital history, and she was living with a man she wasn't even married to. And all Jesus does is tell her that he knows that, and she becomes a believer, you know, because she she didn't have the obstacle of uh, religion and thinking that she could save herself. She knew she couldn't. And so when Jesus was both kind to her and fully aware of her sin, she instantly understood, here's, here's a guy who understands how to be saved from all that guilt. And, uh, and, that's, and she and her whole village became believers. So uh, that's the consistent message through scripture. You can't save yourself. You need a savior. And it doesn't matter how religious you are or how evil you are. You're lost until you trust Christ and let him save you. And that's the message of Calvinism as well, that we are totally depraved, all of us. That's, that's really the starting point of Calvinist doctrine, the total depravity of humanity, that sin has so infected us that it has corrupted every part of our being so that my will, my emotions, my mind, my intellect, all of that is tainted with sin so that everything I do, even the best things I do, are, are corrupted by evil motives and selfish things so that I might look like a great philanthropist and religious person on the outside, but uh, because even my best works are tainted with self-love and and a desire for you know, human applause and all those things, it's still sin. And that's what scripture means when it says all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags, like soiled garments. Uh, and, and it uses a word that's vile there. It's saying that's that's how good is the very thing I learned from reading First Corinthians. God hates even the best things about us because they're tainted with sin. And he's so pure and holy, he can't look at sinful things with approval. So even the best things we do are enough to get us damned to hell forever. And a person who's plumbed the depths of sin understands that. He knows the, the weight of his guilt. A person who's religious and prim and proper may not feel that. So actually, uh, when it comes to responding to the gospel, uh, those people with face tattoos and, and troubled lives actually have a step up on the people who think they're really good because they're religious. Yeah. Even those who, who are not religious in the outward sense. Um, yeah. Even though Paul says everybody is um, religious in their own way, you know, suppressing the truth and suppressing it and, and their own righteousness in Romans one. And, you know, and I see it all the time when I go to the prisons, whether it's in Canyon city or when I go to Huntington beach, it's like those in Canyon city um, in the supermax, they are way more easier to like just take them anywhere I want to go in the Bible without a hassle. And then like for those in Huntington Beach who have like BMWs and they have like, you know, they seem to have it together. And it's like, those are the hardest for people to reach. Um, it reminds me of this quote. And luckily I found it um, real quick when you were talking. Um, it says, and it's from, from, from Spurgeon. And I quote, it says, when a man has been in the fire and has the smell of it still upon him, he is the one to warn others not to meddle with fire. And it's like, and then he goes on and he says, the best gamekeepers are those who used to be poachers. And the best preachers to great to great sinners are those who were once as just as they themselves are. So um, basically he's saying great preachers used to be great sinners. <laughs> so they know the sinner's heart. They they know. Uh, you know, basically another quote, uh, they were in the fire, right? In the burning building. So they have the smell of fire on them. So they're the best people to go out there and preach the gospel, basically, is what he's saying. Right. And understand, Spurgeon isn't saying that you have to you have to mess around with a whole lot of grotesque sin or you can't yeah. understand the gospel. He actually classified this is one of the most interesting things about Spurgeon to me. He classified himself as a great sinner. Well, the reality is he was born into a pastor's home raised by for the earliest years of his life by his grandfather, who was also a pastor, reading Puritan works before he was 12 years old. And yet he wasn't converted until he was about 15. And he went through about four years of intense inward struggle because he knew he wasn't saved. And uh, he felt the weight of 
his sin, it couldn't have been gross sin because he was just a little boy, but, but he was so troubled by any sin that he just went through, he lived under a dark cloud for about four years. And so when he finally found the gospel, uh, he, it, 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 that feeling of the weight of his sin never left him. And so he, in one place, he refers to us, those of us who lived under sin for a long time. And I'm thinking, he was saved when he was 15. And, you know, he, he, the sin the sin he's talking about is whatever sins he committed from age 12 to age 15. It can't be the sort of scandalous, you know, grotesque. He didn't commit murder. He didn't commit thievery. He didn't do any of the things that we normally think of as the really bad sins. And right. yet he had this feeling uh, about the weight of guilt that shaped all of his preaching so that he had he, he had experienced the the sense of guilt that he would have if he'd been like Jeffrey Dahmer or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, but he actually didn't have to mess around with sin as much as some people today do in order to feel that guilt. Right. But it was that it was that feeling of utter lostness that he experienced for four years that gave real weight to his gospel appeals. He knew what it was like to live under a burden of sin that was almost unbearable. And, and you know what? Let, let's transition into that a little bit because, you know, he, he, his life from reading just a little bit of his biography, it sounds like it was marked with uh, suffering with, uh, you know, mentally and physically, I think. Yes. Um, you know, from an early age of 22, I read that there was an episode where he was preaching at the Gardens Music Hall or something when a couple of yeah. pranksters, a couple of pranksters came in and they yelled fire. So yeah. It, it kind of started like a panic. It started to panic. And er imagine everybody, you know, at that time running to the exits and tripling people. Like I, I read that some people got killed. Even some people got hurt. So imagine getting ran over by a bunch of feet. Right. And then like his mind was never the same again. And, and let me quote his wife, Susanna. Um, he, she says, and I quote, my beloved, my, my beloved is anguish was so deep and violent that reason seemed to totter in her throne. And we, her, her and Spurgeon, sometimes feared that he would never preach again. So like that episode, that night or that day, whenever that was, I don't know, I'm, I don't remember if it was night or day, but he was preaching and all of a sudden this episode happens when he was preaching and because of a couple of pranksters, it just impacted him psych psychologically. And he, and even his wife says that from that day on, from age 22, he was never the same again, psychologically, mentally. So like, that, that's right. And that went on for the rest of his life. That, yeah. that incident happened uh, shortly after he came to London. You said he was 22, right? Yeah. So it was about three years into his ministry in London, maybe just two years. Uh, when he started in London, the building where the church gathered was right down next to the river on the South Bank in London. And it was an it was in an area that, you know, in those days, they didn't have good sewage control. It smelled bad. It was hot. It was a horrible place to have a church. And yet, because of his preaching, they packed the place to the rafters. And couldn't hold anymore. So they knew they needed to build a new facility. And while they were building a new church in a different area, they moved the Sunday morning services to an auditorium at what was called Surrey Gardens. It was a park with a building that had been built to be a music hall. Uh, uh, the, the acoustics were pretty good because it was built for music. Mm -hmm. It was a round uh, arena kind of gathering. It's and like it had, opera, right? It's like yeah, opera. and it had balconies. And it would seat, I think, maybe three or four thousand people. So a lot. Of, it was it was a, a big facility, and a lot of people could cram in there. And on the very first Sunday he was there, it was jammed full, and there was a coordinated attack against him. Some young miscreants had come and sort of spaced themselves around, and they they had planned at a certain time. I think it was before the sermon even started to begin to yell fire, fire. The, the rafters are falling and and it started a panic. And I think I think as many as eight people were killed in this disaster. Yeah. And then and Spurgeon himself was so traumatized by the event that he fainted. They had to carry him away 
and he didn't wake up for two or three days. And um, then the newspapers savaged him. They blamed him for the if, for the problem. They said if he wasn't so arrogant as to think he needed to preach to, you know, 5000 people at a time, this never would have happened. They, they basically blamed him. And it sounds like, uh, it sounds like he, CNN today. So, yeah. Yeah. It's changed there. Yeah. <laughs> so but, but uh, that that he, episode alone just changed mentally, which is for right. Me, he I'm suffered thinking. with depression for the rest of his life. Yeah. For for the rest of his life, he was susceptible to a deep depressions. Uh, and and I think he was kind of a melancholy character even before. That's one of the reasons that the weight of his sin troubled him so much. He he tended to be a bit melancholy. But uh, he also testified that these struggles with depression really lent passion to his preaching. Uh, and and you you can't tell from reading the sermons that this is a man living under a black cloud. But um, he, he he used to write about that. Some of the early biographies didn't make a whole lot out of that. They they you know Victorian biographies wanted to make a hero out of Spurgeon, so they left a lot of the a lot of the stuff that you know might not be utterly positive and heroic out. The fact that he just struggled with depression is uh, one of the things about Spurgeon that has more more and more come to light over the past 50 years. And there are a couple of books that have been written about his battles with depression. And I, you know, anybody who uh, who struggles with constant melancholy, I always point them to Spurgeon and some of the things he said about it, because his experience with that sort of thing was profound. And you know how it is if you've ever experienced depression, you don't want to work. You don't want to do anything. He pressed ahead through all of that and never, never let it hinder his preaching ministry or his preparation or his writing. He just continued to work and uh, the Lord blessed him greatly for it. Yeah. Amen. And then it didn't stop there. Right. Because a lot of people like to think, oh, you know, Calvin and Luther and Spurgeon, they live the rosy, rosy walk in the park life. It's like, well, no, if you actually read their biography, their, their bios, they actually suffered a lot of like <laughs> personal trauma and like mental trauma. Like Calvin lost a couple of his wives and kids and Luther lost a bunch of people, lived in the bubonic plague, for example, uh, something that's a true plague, by the way. And then, um, you know, Spurgeon suffered physically as well. So not just mentally. Like, like with depression and stuff like that. Like I think from age 33, from what I read in his biography, he suffered from um, kidney gout. Yeah, kidney um, kidney inflation inflammation, which is called Bright's disease, as um, as, aka gout. And then um, I, you know, a bunch of other stuff that I can't even pronounce because I'm not a, like a. Yeah, I think I think it's possible that the the gout was a side effect of his Bright's disease, but you're right. He had both Bright's disease and gout. Uh, gout is a, a, a sort of an arthritic pain that's caused by uric acid in the blood. And it's painful. I've had gout. Uh, for me, it only affected my big toe, but it's debilitating. Uh, it, 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 it causes your joints to feel like they, they've just been like somebody's hitting with a hammer. It's, it's serious pain. And he suffered with it all the time, uh, and then Bright's disease, and that that plus the stress of some of the theological controversies that he he had to deal with, uh, I believe took his life fairly early. I think he was in his fifties when he died, yeah. which is young, That's and um, yeah. and yet he looked and sounded like an old man. He walked with a cane. Uh, this all took a great toll on him physically, and on top of that, his wife was a a long time. Uh, invalid. She had she had born twins. He had twin sons, the only offspring Spurgeon ever had. Both of them became preachers. But in uh, something happened in the process of childbirth that left her uh, unable to basically go out or travel or or whatever. So she was a homebound invalid invalid for most of their married life, and she spent her energies uh, sending out books all over the world to pastors. And it's not unusual these days even to find uh, old uh, first edition books by Spurgeon on eBay 
that include a signature from Susanna Spurgeon, uh, uh, an inscription that she would write by hand uh, as she was sending these books out to pastors. And so that was her ministry. She had a book ministry that was incredible. Uh, And she filled the world with Spurgeon's books that she sent out freely. Uh, And Spurgeon also, because of his infirmities, uh, during the winters in his later life, uh, for the last 15 or 20 years of his life, he had to take the winters off and leave London at the peak of the cold season and go to the south of France where it was warmer. Mm -hmm. That's where he ultimately died. In, in on the French Riviera in a small hotel room there, uh, he died. Yeah. yeah, a lot of English people go south, uh, Spain, Portugal, stuff like that, because this is warm weather. Um, let, um, let, let's talk about one of the most bitter fights of his life, and it's called the downgrade controversy. Um, and I think it all started from an article, from what I understand. It's a little confusing. Um, in terms of who started it or what, if you want to trace it to his beginning. But yeah. It's called the downgrade controversy. And it's called, some say it's the most bitter fight of his, you know, op- one of those oppositions that he ever faced. Uh, first of all, what is the downgrade controversy? How did it start it? And how did he get out of that? Yeah. And let me back up and say it, Spurgeon was no foreigner to controversy. Uh, he, because he believed so firmly in the authority of scripture, it often put him in positions. He didn't like to start fights and he didn't enjoy fights, but he, he would not back off from truth. Even if some alternative view became popular, he'd fight for the truth. And, uh, he had so many conflicts over doctrine over the years that, uh, it was, it just, it, it was kind of a constant thing. Another book by Ian Murray that I would recommend is The Forgotten Spurgeon. It's an older book. was written, I think, in the, around 19, probably in the 1950s, uh, where Ian Murray chronicles all of the doctrinal controversies that Spurgeon had from the time he was young until the end of his life. So it was he was a fighter, a, an unwilling fighter, um, but willing to stand for the truth. And the biggest conflict he ever had, as you said, was the downgrade controversy. This started, I think, around uh, 1887 or thereabout. He he published this magazine called The Sword and the Trowel. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lead article one month was an article called The Downgrade. And it was written by a friend of Spurgeon's. Robert Schindler was his name. He was a fellow pastor And Schindler was a student of church history, and he was pointing out that uh, there were cycles of decline and apostasy uh, among Protestants that went all the way back to the beginning of the Protestant Reformation with the Socinians. Socinianism was a heresy that cropped up during the lifetime of Calvin, and uh, Calvin even corresponded with, there was an uncle and a a nephew named Socinus, they were uh, Italian guys. Who, who were throwing out these ideas. They, they originally joined the Reformation and abandoned the Catholic Church, but they began to reject everything that smacked of Catholicity, including the doctrine of the Trinity, the authority of Scripture, all the miracles of the Bible. They basically became the quintessential theological liberals, and the system they started was called Socinianism. And it, it, uh, it was the first great sort of counterattack against the Protestant Reformation from within Protestantism. But Schindler was pointing out that every other generation or so, there'd be a new manifestation of these Socinian ideas. So you had things like deism and Unitarianism, and now in Spurgeon's time, modernism, and and even beyond Spurgeon, you have liberalism, and then the emerging church movement, and now even the social justice movement smacks of some of the same ideas. And uh, Schindler was pointing out that these are the same set of questions that come up where it starts with the sort of gentle questioning about the authority of Scripture. And then there's an attack on the doctrine of the atonement, the idea that uh, substitutionary atonement, where my sins are imputed to Christ and his righteousness is imputed to us and God punishes him for sins he didn't commit. 
Uh, the Socinian said, that's a, it's a grotesque idea. God's not that unfair to inflict punishment on his own son for sins that others committed. And they totally deny the atonement of Christ through uh, by an appeal to uh, a, a humanistic idea of what's just and fair. And, you know, if you listen carefully, you'll, you'll know that there are multitude of voices even today making those same challenges against yeah. the gospel. And Schindler was saying this happens every generation or so. And and it, because we don't learn from history, younger generations never understand that an attack on the atonement like that is ultimately fatal to the gospel itself. It will lead churches and individuals away from Christianity. And he likened it to a downgrade on a steep hill uh, where in those days, of course, you didn't have truckers. They had horses and carriages, but the same idea. You get on the downgrade and it's slippery and it's all downhill and you can't you can't apply enough brakes to stop once you get on it. So once you pull on to the downgrade, you're going to go all the way down and ultimately go off the edge of the mountain and it's destructive. And you might go at a fast speed or a slow speed, but ultimately at the end, there's nothing but disaster. It's a great article. I was, actually, it was two part articles that uh, Schindler wrote, the downgrade part one, and then in the following month, the downgrade part two. And in the process, he was pointing out that within the Baptist Union of Spurgeon's day, there were people who were on the downgrade teaching these liberalizing ideas that undermined the gospel and that the Baptist Union was full of people like that. Well, the Baptist Union wasn't happy uh, with Schindler's assessment and Spurgeon's support of that. Spurgeon was a member of the Baptist Union, but he was troubled by the fact that other Baptist pastors were questioning things that he considered rightly to be essential to the gospel. And he's warning, this is a this is a, a downhill road that leads to disaster. And uh, the attack he got, the pushback from the mainstream, I think even Spurgeon perhaps underestimated how far modernism had gone. I mean, understand the context. These were the days of Charles Darwin and Darwin's evolutionary theory was becoming popular. And if you read uh, resources like the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, which was written also during that same era, You'll find bits in there where or or commentaries from that era where commentators and Bible scholars were beginning to question the historical accuracy of Scripture and the the scientific accuracy of it. And, and, you know, do we teach a story like Jonah being swallowed by the fish as if this literally happened? And uh, a creationism, we got to back away from the idea that God created the world in six days by fiat, you know, by just speaking the word and things were created. And they're wanting to embrace Darwin's ideas and just like people are today. Mm-hmm. And Spurgeon said that's a that's a road that's ultimately going to cost cost us clarity with regard to the gospel and in fact sacrifice the gospel itself. And churches that follow that path won't even be Christian anymore. And he was absolutely right. History vindicated him. But during his era and up up to his death, I think, what did I say? That those original articles were around 1887. 87. It came out in March. So and, okay. the anniversary and, is coming up here. All right. So and Spurgeon died in 92. So uh, the, the last five years of his life were consumed by this controversy. And yet the sermons he preached during that era are some of his best. He wrote a little book called The Greatest Fight in the World, describing his stance in the downgrade thing. That's online, by the way. You can read it if you like. And uh, in the process, I think it was in The Greatest Fight in the World, or maybe it was just one of his sermons. He said, this conflict is killing me. And he meant that literally. And he was right. The stress of it, combined with uh, Bright's disease and gout, ultimately took his life. So, uh, wow. It's crazy to think um, if we are on the downgrade again um, or at what wave or level we are at. Um, do you think, uh, I haven't read too, because like you said, there's over 3,000 sermons, but um, do you think uh, Spurgeon was like a post mill or on mill or pre mill? No, he was pre mill. Okay. He was he was pre mill and explicitly so. He didn't okay. make a big deal out of it. He didn't, he didn't 
He didn't deal with eschatology a whole lot, but yeah. in his doctrinal statement mm-hmm. and in the in the downgrade, he uh, he defended premillennialism because uh, I think he was wary of uh, uh, of the fact that amillennialism, or as they pronounce it in England, amillennialism, uh, ha- has built into it the necessity to spiritualize certain prophetic passages from the Old Testament. You can't interpret them literally and be a uh, an amillennialist. And I think, I think Spurgeon recognized that and wasn't really willing to, to go with the amillennialists. It, but this wasn't really an aspect of what he became embattled over. He understood that there are good sound people who are mm-hmm. premillennial, postmillennial. Mm-hmm. He read a book by a preterist at one point and was, uh, was way more positive about it than I would have been. Preterism is the idea that all of the prophecies in Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation were fulfilled uh, around AD 70 when the Romans sacked Jerusalem, that all of those disasters that are described in the book of Revelation and the wars and rumors of wars and stuff like that in Matthew 24, all of that refers to the Roman sacking of Israel. That's preterism. uh, And that's also prevalent today. Uh, Spurgeon read an early preterist work and said he found it intriguing and partly convincing, but he didn't become a preterist. Uh, he was premillennial, I think, until he died. But it was yeah. historic premill. He wasn't right, right. He was. It wasn't dispensationalist premill. So he wouldn't have been the same kind of premillennialist as John MacArthur or or uh, my own church's doctrinal statement affirms. A different kind of premillennialism, but it was still premillennial in that he believed Christ would return and establish his kingdom, whereas postmillennialists believe the church will establish the kingdom and then Christ will return. And amillennialists believe we're in the kingdom already. So, I mean, that's a thumbnail sketch of the difference. Right. And then the panmillennialist is like, you know, it'll all pan out in the was, end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, well, Bill, that was an awesome, awesome just intro. If somebody is listening and they want to make a movie of Charles Spurgeon, like a really good one on Netflix that that's solid, like a 10 episode and it's like faithful, trust me, I'm all yours. Like uh, I'm going to be the first one to watch that thing, binge watch it. Um, so yeah, I hope and pray that somebody will make a, a real life show or a movie about Spurgeon because his life does have character development it has it has everything it has romance it has you know his life has a little of everything controversy uh then it has like that that death you know that early death of 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 someone dies young you know so his life would be a perfect really good movie i would love to see one day yeah i like the idea of a 10 part sort of mini series uh yeah. on that there are a couple of documentaries if you do a search at youtube there are a couple of pretty good documentaries that chronicle the life of Spurgeon in, you know, 45 minutes or so. There aren't any 10 part miniseries that I'm aware of, but there are a couple of good films out there. Mm. All right. So any last words that you would like to encourage maybe a young pastor out there listening and in Egypt, because I have listeners in Egypt, um, South Africa, Ukraine. I have listeners in Ukraine right now. Um, anybody out there who's like, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and check out this Spurgeon. Where should I start? What sermon should I read? Yeah, in fact, I've been to Ukraine and taught about Spurgeon there. So hi to those in Ukraine, and we're praying for you all. Yeah, no, this would be my summary on Spurgeon, and it's this. I I think you can't read too much Spurgeon. You cannot be too influenced by him. Uh, I think think if he's going to influence you, it's going to be for good. So Read as much Spurgeon as you can. There's enough out there. I I forget who it was, but some famous person said, hey, sell all your possessions and buy Spurgeon books. You don't even have to do that anymore because everything Spurgeon ever wrote, almost everything he ever wrote, is available for free on the Internet. And what's that website again that you have that you started in 95? Well, it's moved now. My original website was Spurgeon.org. And if you go there, what you get is the website of... uh, the Spurgeon Library in Kansas City, and they have a ton of really good resources. So go there, Spurgeon.org. I kept my website intact the way it was, 
And you'll find it at Romans45.org. I just gave them the Spurgeon domain and, and made a new domain that's my favorite Bible verse, Romans 4, verse 5. So it's Romans45.org. And that will take you to a just a little menu page that has uh, links to all of my websites. Look for the picture of Spurgeon, click on that, and you'll find the original Spurgeon archive. There's enough there to keep you reading for a decade. Uh, I saw the, I saw the the list of sermons. They're all yeah. numbered, and I'm like, oh man, yeah. <laughs> uh, where where can people follow you or find you? You know, I'm most prolific, I think, on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you just do a Google search for my name and Twitter, I give you my Twitter handle, but it's kind of hard to explain. It's Phil Johnson with an underlying character after the word Phil and after the word Johnson on Twitter. But if you just if you just Google Phil Johnson Twitter, I think I'm the first Phil Johnson that comes up. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, once this is all done, I'll, I'll go ahead and share this with my Twitter followers and everybody on there will find you as well. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for coming on here and you know sharing Spurgeon, encouraging us to really um, look at him from you know introspectively and outwardly um, and to read as much as possible with Spurgeon because it's never enough. Yeah, thank um, you, Jesse. And thanks for the honorary degree. I, I should say I'm not a doctor. And this is one of the things about Spurgeon that's most fascinating, I mm-hmm. think, I'm not a doctor because I never went to seminary. I, I went to Bible college and then got into publishing and never made it back to school, sadly. Uh, so I don't have a doctorate of any kind. And they don't even they don't even let me in the veterinarian without, you know. <laughs> so so, doc, so 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 you're like a Dr. Pepper. No yeah. doctors, no, no doctorates or maybe like a Dr. Dre. He's not a doctor. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so and Dr. Phil is that fat guy on TV that gives people <laughs> bad advice. So that's true. Just call me Phil. But uh, what I was going to say about Spurgeon is he never even went to college. It's true. Every everything he learned, he learned just from devouring books on his own. And yet his theology is impeccable. Like I said, it doesn't change from the beginning to the end of his life. Mm-hmm. Not that he was, you know, stubbornly immovable or whatever, but he didn't preach on any subject until he had thoroughly studied it and mastered it and fixed his position. And he was not the kind of guy to to be fickle. And as you read his sermons in order, you'll find in the early years, he studied theology proper and basic theological issues. And once he had all of that in place, he began to, you know, sort of branch out into other uh, subjects further away from, you know, just basic Trinitarianism and stuff like that. Uh, So you can see the development of his theology as he preaches. He's studying while he's pastoring and it just gets more and more profound and more and more specific as time goes but uh it's it's a pretty interesting approach to and and I think the ideal approach to doing systematic theology in scripture rather than using a systematic theology textbook amen um so for those who don't know you can find me on twitter as well at the chicano knox Please follow me on, on there. Share Bible theory with your homies, with your friends. And don't forget to uh, support me on Patreon. I'm on Patreon now. I'm creating my own website. So that's coming soon. So with that being said, this is the end of the episode. Until the next time, I appreciate it. Keep going on for Christ. Thank you for listening to Bible Theory. Bible theory. Don't forget to share this with your homies. Support Bible Theory on Patreon. Follow me on Twitter at the Chicano Knox. Like and subscribe to Bible Theory on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcast, iHeartRadio, and more. Gracias por escuchar Bible Theory. No olvides a compartir esto con tus homies. Apoya Bible Theory and Patreon. Sígame en Twitter and the Chicano Knox. Dame un like y suscríbete a Bible Theory and Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcast, iHeartRadio, y más.